a seaside lunch with an incredible view and a side order of science? Yep, there's some important environmental research going on at this oyster farm. Here on Tomales Bay, north of San Francisco, these oysters undergo an incredible amount of scrutiny. In fact, this whole area turns out to be a perfect outdoor laboratory. Pretty much all the major kind of ecological communities are within arm's reach here. John Lagier is a professor of oceanography at the nearby Bodega Marine Laboratory, operated by the University of California at Davis. And what researchers have learned about oysters is that these tasty little bivalves are already reacting to climate change. Since oysters are on the menu a few miles away at the Hog Island Oyster Farm, climate change is a big concern. Not just in the future, but right now. Terry Sawyer is the co-owner. I'm working on research right now in collaboration with UC Davis and Bodega Bay Marine Laboratories. And we're working on trying to understand what's going on out there. And what's going on? Air pollution is making the ocean water more acidic. It's called ocean acidification. Ocean acidification is caused by our human activities, our industrial activities, and driving around in cars. Um, carbon dioxide is released to the atmosphere. Tessa Hill is an associate professor at UC Davis and a resident at Bodega Marine Lab. It turns out the ocean is a tremendous sponge for carbon dioxide, so it actually soaks it up from the atmosphere. And the oysters really don't like all that extra carbon and acidity. It makes it more difficult to form shells and it's not that it gets that low that it's going to dissolve that shell, but the organism is spending more effort, like the oyster has to work at it, maybe it's putting more of its scarce resources into making a shell and less to make babies or to grow fatter or bigger. So at the oyster farm, Sawyer gives his oysters a head start by buying babies or seed from hatcheries. This is our land base, so this is where the seed comes in and is handled, and we call it seed. It goes out into the bay after it's been held in nursery. While they're growing in their tanks, he's analyzing the ocean water that's pumping over them. So what we have here is an upwelling situation. This is called an upwelling. Two pumps are running to do this right now. This is what we do, is we just sort of modify and we try to, uh, different methods. This is seed, and in this case it's manila clam seed. These are miniature versions of what we will have out there. And while he is tracking the oyster's needs, Tessa Hill is tracking them too, with remote sensors. So we're able to have a real-time system with data flowing across the screen so that Terry can see what the water looks like that's going into his tank. You can see the water bubbling through this instrument. That's basically before it's analyzed for the carbon dioxide concentration. And understanding with the tests and measuring what's going on in the water, uh, uh, adapting to when there's excessive runoff due to rainfall. And that water quality that's being affected by all of that is what I need to produce a protein, a food. If Sawyer doesn't like the water balance he sees, he can make changes. If I'm seeing them start to degrade, I can actually start to modify the water that these, the seed is in. So this is our what we call our grow out. This represents a harvest. Okay. These guys are getting ready to start busting these bags open. They'll unzip one side and hang it on the, on the sorting system over there. Huge tubs wash and sort the oysters because they're all different sizes. Conveyor belts are the mass transit that takes them to the processing area. Because they're irregularly shaped, the final sort is over here. Experienced sorters separate the irregularly shaped, the large and the small, and weed out those that are dead or returned. I'm going to show you the end product. So, that looks like what I'm used to seeing. Back at the marine lab, they're growing oysters too, but in conditions that mimic what climate change will be like a hundred years from now. They compare it to a runaway train. We are going to have change. Um, we really need to put those brakes on immediately so we don't have too much more change. But at the same time, we have to figure out how that ecosystem will adapt and how we as society will adapt. One simple way to adapt could involve planting more seagrass. There are environments like seagrass beds and kelp forests where the, the plants are actually using photosynthesis, so they're removing carbon from the ocean water. We're working closely with Terry and, the, um, and his colleagues at the Oyster Company to see if, if actually um, managing seagrass beds out in this environment might help this estuary. And it may sound odd, 
but the oysters themselves help improve seawater because they filter it by eating. We're actually able to reintroduce a filter feeder back out there and use it as a food source and it improves the water and I'm monitoring what's going on in that water. So that's a pretty good system. Scientists, however, still worry about the big picture. These other smaller steps will help protect individual smaller environments, but they don't get at the heart of the problem, and the heart of the problem is carbon dioxide emissions. Bottom line is, is we are burning fossil fuels that are generating CO2, tremendous amounts of CO2. The only real solution to ocean acidification is to get away from fossil fuels. That's a tall order and a complicated problem but an essential goal if it means our children and grandchildren will have the opportunity to enjoy a day like this. Dining seaside on some plump, juicy oysters.